SJC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. Good morning, St. John family, and welcome to this week's edition of SJC News. Take note of all of the events happening with our ministries and be sure to do your part. Remember, every joint supplieth. Happy birthday to those born during the month of May. We celebrate with you and pray that God blesses you with a year filled with joy. Happy anniversary to those celebrating nuptials during the month of May. May you continue to be in love and harmony with one another as long as you live. St. John's Youth Ministry presents Youth Fun Night, Wednesday, May 19th, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Stars and Strikes. Please RSVP via email by May 15th to St. John AME Membership at gmail.com. Central High School presents Coach C. Wright as Staff Member of the Week. Congratulations, Coach Wright, for being selected as the 2021 Alabama North-South All-Star Game Coach. Job well done, Coach Wright. Be sure to join Pastor Washington each Monday and Friday morning at 7 a.m. for prayer and devotion. Through God's Word, we learn that your house is only as strong as the foundation is built upon and that the sure foundation of God's Word with prayer will stand. Please support St. John with your stewardship and trust God with it. Exodus 35 and 5 says, From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering. St. John family, we will experience communion differently this first Sunday of May 2021. Your Zoom link has been shared by Pastor and we look to see you at 6 p.m. Those in need of a communion kit, please stop by the church today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. This concludes today's edition of SJC News. Be informed, stay connected, and spread the news. Now here's Donya Albright. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning and welcome to our virtual worship experience here with the wonderful people of St. John in Columbus, Georgia. It's a joy to greet you on the first Sunday of a brand new month. We have certainly been blessed to enjoy the most wonderful month in the year, April. And now we've come to month number five. Can you believe it? We are already in month number five of the year 2021. Time does not stand still. And as we enter this brand new month, it's a blessing to be with you. Let me give you a moment to gather yourselves and give you a reason to celebrate, to praise God, and to, as the old folk would say, give God the glory. You have survived the month of April. April was full of ups and downs. It's a beautiful month and full of luxury as well. But certainly, family, you have survived. And in spite of all of the issues that the month of April produced and all of the issues that this year has produced, God has graced you with mercy and kindness and brought you into month number five. We owe the Lord some praise. We owe God a thank you. We owe God so much. And right now, I want to give you a moment to offer your own personal thanks to God. Let's take a moment of silence or a moment of shouting and give God glory. Thank you. Truly, God has been so good.
with that family, I want to invite you now on this special day, this Lord's Day, to turn back with me to the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. That's right, we were there last week. We come back to conclude this sermonic moment together in chapter one of Mark's Gospel, starting at verse number 29. It's a pleasure to join you in hearing God speak to us. And certainly I invite you to turn in your own Bible to Mark chapter one, verse 29. I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and I hope that you can find your way to a Bible and join us. Shall we go to the word? As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in the bed with the fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her body, and she began to serve them. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, on this special Lord's Day, I come back to an important message that God has for you and for me at a time like this in our life. When Jesus enters your house. When Jesus enters your house. Beloved, we are accustomed now to the story and the quick moves of the gospel writer, Mark. For some reason, more than others, Mark as a writer enjoys placing Jesus in the house. Sometimes Mark places the miracles that Jesus does in the lives of anyone that comes to him, not in the street, not in the church, not in the woods, but family, Jesus does miracles in Mark's gospel, you got it, in the house. Something special and spectacular happens in the house. Maybe Mark understands that the house is the home front, the safe place, the space where which you can be unguarded and you can undress. And not just physically, but also unguarded and undress yourselves spiritually, emotionally, and even intellectually. Maybe Mark understands that the home, the house, is where the nucleus of our heart lives. Maybe Mark understands that, and so he places one of the early miracles in his gospel of Jesus, you got it, in a house. Not just any old house, family, but Jesus addresses something, and I thank God for this revelation right now. Jesus comes to the house of those who believe in him, who have followed him, and who are seeking to learn from him and become, watch this, better because of him. Brothers and sisters, that shouts me early. It's not a kickstand, it's a shout moment right now. To understand that our God, through Christ Jesus, desires to be in the places that you and I, his followers, are. I'm grateful that there is not a place that I can go that Jesus Christ does not want to come. I'm thankful that he will come to my house, no matter how dirty, how, no matter how filthy, and no matter how unkept it might be, Jesus will come if, watch this, if I'm following him. And so that shouts me because I want to keep following him so that he will also get this, come where I am. And I'm not certain if you're on the fence with whether your commitment to Christ this year is waning already in month five. But I'm certain that if you have the courage to stick with him, to follow him, to always tune your attention to what Jesus Christ wants in his word, he will come to your house. And I'm so grateful, family, that he comes to the house of these two wonderful servants, Simon and Andrew. It is in the house that Jesus does a miraculous thing. And so I want to invite you at this very moment to let him come to your house, to set the stage for Jesus to come to your house. The word testifies, family, that Simon and Andrew bring Jesus to their house. Remember last week we talked about the fact that there are two families that live in the same house, that live under the same roof, and the tension that can exist when too many grown folks live in the one house. 
some of us hear me this morning and say, honey, sometimes it's tough. It's just tough for my spouse and I to be under the same roof. Sometimes it's tough for you, your spouse and your children to be under the same roof. Or maybe it's you and a sibling or maybe it's you and a roommate. However, you are connected to others, sometimes family. It can be a tension filled moment to have too many adults in one house. How do you survive? Well, according to this text, the survival is interesting. The word comes to Jesus that when he enters the house, there's a problem. The problem is not between two brothers, though. The problem is that a mother-in-law, the mother-in-law of Simon, did you catch that? Andrew may have a different mother-in-law. Actually, he does. And so his mother-in-law is well, but Simon's mother-in-law family is not. Simon's mother-in-law, we learned last week that it's not so important uh, to, to have your name mentioned as it is important to make sure that someone you're connected to can get you to God through Christ Jesus. And so with that word, that, that level of importance, family, guess what happens? Jesus enters the house and as he enters the house, he is told that the mother-in-law Simon is ill. We understand the necessary need for us today to, to, to raise our level of praise, to raise our level of what? Prayer life to raise our level of depending on the promises of God for everything necessary. But what does God conclude this with today? How does God encourage us this week? How are you and I going to get through our Mondays and our Fridays? How are we going to survive Wednesday and Thursday? And let us not forget the trouble that Tuesday can produce. How are we going to make it? What's God got to say in these three verses, family, that will give us strength, to give us courage and give us peace that all will be well. I'm glad you asked and I found some nuggets that I have to share. In these verses, beloved, here is what I discovered, that Jesus is willing to do something in a house that everybody else cannot do. And that right there is a hermeneutical kickstand. That moment right there where you and I come to grips with the fact that there are some things that only Jesus can do in our house and no one else can do them. I, I want to pause and make sure you understand that you can invite everybody in, but there are some things that only our Lord Jesus Christ can do. There are some places in your home that only the Lord can clean up. There are some demonic adjutants in your life that live and reside in the place of your home that only our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has the power, the authority to speak to and they will leave. Don't be fooled on today believing that your house being physically clean also means that it's spiritually clean. No sir and no ma'am our Lord has to come in. And when the Lord comes in, I can promise you this day that there is a spiritual cleansing that takes place in our home. Do you want him in your house is the real question. Will you let him into your house? Now, here is the dangerous aspect of the text. When he comes in your house, he will expose the area family of disease and challenge. Sometimes we want to live in a ignorant society. Sometimes we want to be ignorant of the realities that are happening in our life. But when Jesus comes into our home because we follow him, be clear that ignorance leaves. I don't know if you understand the brevity of following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But when you and I choose to follow him, be aware that ignorance has to leave. So some of the things that you were ignorant of before you really started following him, they're going to be exposed. Jesus enters our home, enters our life. And as he does, he exposes some sicknesses that we were not wanting to be exposed. He exposes some ways of living that are not godly but he has to correct. In essence, the prayer that we have prayed that God would elevate us when Jesus comes into our home, I've come to announce this morning that the only way the elevation can take place, the only way that prayers are answered, family, is if we are willing to let Jesus expose where the illness, the sickness, and the demonic agitation is. So maybe that's what he's up to in your house. He's just exposing some weak areas. He's just exposing some dark places. 
weaknesses. He's just exposing some weaknesses and some wearinesses that you and I have in our own home that we were ignorant of. And I want to pause and invite you, come on in here, and have a moment to celebrate and give God praise for on this day. The fact that God would enter your house, enter your home, into a place where you reside and expose what's been hurting you and harming you and giving you a problem is good reason to shout. The fact that you prayed about it, you asked God to strengthen you where you were weak, do you remember? You asked God to make a way where there was no way, do you remember? You asked God to relieve you of the pressure and the anxiety that you have and you discover that when he comes in, he exposes where the very pressure and the problem is. This text testifies that when he enters, he's going to go exactly where the disease is. Jesus enters the house and he goes directly to where Simon mother-in-law is existing and laying in the bed, watch this, with the fever. Now I want to walk slow through this because the fever indicates, remember, that there's a disease, there's an infection, and the body is attempting to fight it off. And we know how the body spiritually will fight. What? Prayer, praise, and holding a promise. And today, when you can praise God, as last week suggested, when you can have a faithful and decisive and watch this intentional prayer life, guess what will happen? The Lord will find you, and here's the key, when you hold the promise of God in the face of your illness, in the face of your challenge, in the face, family, of the frustration and the fatigue that's coming from your home or coming from your life, guess what the Lord will do? He will enter the room where it is, and here's my favorite point, he is willing to touch it. This is what other people can't do. Everyone cannot touch what's bothering us. Everyone cannot touch the problems that you have. Everyone is unable to touch a situation that is difficult for you to withstand. And here's the key, Jesus is willing to touch it regardless of the risk. And that's where I want us to start and actually finish too, that Jesus Christ is willing to touch what others won't touch, and as he touches it, he's willing to risk what nobody else is willing to risk. That's in the DNA of our God. That's in the DNA of our religion. That's in the DNA of Christianity. That's in the DNA of your heritage, that the Lord will enter the house, go directly to the spot of illness and challenge and darkness and disease and pestilence and touch it. He is able to touch things that other people will avoid, even you. Peter, excuse me, Simon Peter knew where his, his mother-in-law lived. He knew where she laid, but guess what? He wouldn't touch her. And the reason that Simon wouldn't touch her and others would not touch her family is because they could also be infected by the disease or the fever. Here's the problem. Everyone that comes into the home to touch anything is susceptible to the disease and the infection themselves. But we serve a God who regardless of whether it's COVID-19, whether it's hypertension, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's anxiety, whether it's HIV or AIDS, whether it's cancer, whether it's, watch this, polio, whether it's any kind of challenge that you have, cataracts or you name it, guess what? We serve a God who is willing to touch and not be infected by what he touches. That's the power of God. And that's another shout filled moment, family, that the Lord can touch disease in your life and never be affected. That the Lord can touch what's a problem situation for you and for me. And regardless of how it wakes us weak, it will not weaken our Christ. It will not weaken our God. And I am glad to know that my God is not weakened in the face of my problems, that God is not turned off in the face of my problems. I've never seen God face a problem inclusive of COVID-19 that made God say, I don't know. I've never seen God unwilling to come through hell and the waters that are raised high and not touch us. God is willing to touch 
you and me, regardless of what we're going through. And that's the word for today, that our Lord family will touch everything that's a mess in our life. He'll touch finances. He'll touch fatigue. He'll touch, watch this, he'll touch frustration. He'll touch failures. He'll touch everything that everyone else has turned away from, including you in your life. Jesus will touch it by the power given to him by our God. I want to pause pause and ask you, do you really understand what this means? You see, religious beliefs at the time of this writing was that if anyone touched what was sick, they would not only become sick, but nobody else could touch them. So the truth of the matter is this, Simon and Andrew want Jesus to come fix it because they want to have other people come back to their house. Nobody was coming to their home while it was touched with an infection. That means that families who were friends wouldn't come by. That means that certain popularity contests and certain opportunities to politic and to gain the trust and business of other people by Peter and by Andrew as fishermen could no longer take place. Do you see what I'm saying? Everything was affected by the fact that they had an infectious person in their life and in their home at that. And that's why they really wanted the Lord to come because if Jesus would come and fix it, then their lifestyle could return back to normal. And I don't know about you, but each one of us has something we desperately want our Lord Jesus to touch so that we can return back to normal, so that we can get back to the way things used to be, so that you and I could feel better about coming home than we do about leaving it. Is there anybody willing to acknowledge and to admit on this the Lord's day that there are some things now you need for God to touch so you can be proud of it again, so that you can feel good about it again, so that that you can feel relevant and valued and worthy of what you're dealing with. The Lord has to touch it because everybody else has turned away. May I pause and tell you that there are some people that have turned away from you because of your failure. There are some people that have turned away from you and your life because of what you have sinned in. That's right, that, that good cuss word, S-I-N, sin. That low down ratchet word that invades all of our spaces. The liar gives you this. The fornicator, the adulterer, the thief. Yes, you, all of us, when others are so embarrassed by hanging with us because of our sin and our failure, guess what the Lord says? Leave it alone. I'm on the way and I will touch what everybody else runs from. I'm not afraid now to have a God touch my stuff that is weak and weary. Is there anybody that's with me today that says, Lord, my life is in shambles. Lord, I'm weak. I'm weary. Lord, I'm poor and I need you to touch what other folk won't touch. Can I pause and ask you if you'll let them touch your stewardship? Banks will turn from you, but, but Jesus will still touch you. Banks may never give you what you need to get through to the next month or the next year, but our Lord says, regardless of what credit looks like, I am willing to touch you and open doors for you that no bank can close. Is there anybody grateful that he's willing to touch what others conclude is untouchable? That's the power of our God. That's the power of our Savior. He touches in order to fix. And today, I've simply come to remind you he's willing to touch what you let him touch. Simon and Andrew have to be willing, family, to acknowledge that they need him to touch it. That's a part of the message that's not that clear. It's there, but you miss it. Simon and Andrew have to be willing to tell Jesus where their problem is. He could have found it, but they directed him to it. Sometimes it's necessary for us to just tell God through prayer where our problems are. Address your problems by being honest about where they are. Are they in your spouse, in your children, or in you? Are they in the coworker, the boss, or in you? Are they in your sibling or your parent or in you? Are they in the pastor and the people at the church or are they in you? Where are 
are the problems really residing. And once you are willing to be honest with God about where the problem is, the Lord says, I'll touch it for you. I'll, I can't fix what you haven't acknowledged exists. And so they show him where the mother-in-law is and he goes in and because he sees her, he's able to touch it. And he risks, that's the other piece. He not only touches what nobody else will touch, He's willing, family, to risk his, watch this, he's willing to risk his reputation for our inclusion and our redemption. That, that, that's awesome. He's willing to risk his reputation for our redemption. Whew, I don't know about you, but it is my hope, my prayer, and my desire that you would allow the Lord to touch so that you might be redeemed. He is willing to let go of his reputation in order for our redemption. Do you realize how it must look that God is willing to be caught hanging out in your house? Do you realize with all the stuff you've done and with all the mistakes I've made and with all the lies that we have all told, with all of the ways we have slipped and, sl and slid into places, with all of the bum fumbles, with all of the lying situations we found ourselves in. And please don't, don't, don't tell me you don't lie. Please don't do that. Be honest about it. With all of the frailties of your life to know what you know about yourself, and sometimes you don't want to deal with you. You, you want to run from yourself. How do you think it feels for God to never walk away from you? Do you realize the reputation of God by hanging out with you? How do you think God feels that God hangs out with us and it does nothing for our reputation, for his reputation, for God's reputation. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about the fact that you don't want to hang with certain folk because of how it will affect your rep? Well, how about God, regardless of how your lifestyle and your actions and behavior affect how people will look at God, God does not care. He's willing to risk his reputation for your redemption. And that's what the Lord does. He risks the reputation that he has and the associations that he has in order to redeem the mother-in-law of Simon Peter. And I don't know about you, but anybody willing to risk their reputation for my redemption has got my attention. Anybody willing to give up how people feel about them and how they perceive them so that I might become better, so that I might be healed, so that I might be set free, so that I might have a brand new chance, so that I might be included in the plan of salvation and life everlasting, I'm willing to follow. The Lord is willing to risk his reputation for our redemption and I'm so thankful. Is there anybody thankful with me that he's willing to risk his reputation for your redemption. Oh, brothers and sisters, oh, family members, that's enough meat for today. But there's one more thing I want to drop in your spirit and I'm done. On this, the Lord's day, he risks, he touches, well, actually he touches and then he risks. And then family, here is something that he does. He rewards those who have faith in him. There is a reward for having faith in God through Christ Jesus. There is a reward for having faith in God through Christ Jesus. I know that sometimes we do things in the life of the church out of a habit. Sometimes we do them because we feel obligated. Sometimes we do them because family, we don't know what else to do. We're just doing what we have been instructed and we have been doing for years. But I want to remind you, as I preach to myself, that there is a reward, family, for believing in the power of God at work in your life. There is a reward that our God gives for trusting him with what's most precious to us. Family, never underestimate the fact that when you place what matters to you in the hands of God, God will reward us. The text tells us that not only does he touch 
And not only does he risk rep, but he rewards. What's he give her? She's healed. She gets up and then starts to serve. And I know some of you are caught off guard and saying, well, well it doesn't make sense. How, how, why would he let her serve after she'd been sick? Shouldn't she rest and get well? The reward is that she shows how much of a disciple she is. The reward is not just her healing, but the reward is that she reveals to God how much she appreciates him by serving him. You missed it. Whenever God rewards us because we've trusted him through the difficulty and the illness, the reward that we give back to God is our willingness to serve him, our willingness to trust him again, our willingness to put the rest of our life in God's hands. The reward God gives to us requires that we reward God with even more trust, that we reward God with even more responsibility, that we reward God with more of our own life. She gets up and guess what? Serves Jesus. Her reward was to be healed. Now she rewards the Lord by serving him. And I don't know about you, but that's a lesson for me. That's why I wanted to get to that when the Lord has rewarded us with healing, when the Lord has rewarded us because we've trusted him with the open door, when the Lord has rewarded us by honoring our prayer requests and answering them just as he said he would, our reward to God must be that we serve him. Our reward must be that we're willing to be faithful unto death. Our reward must be that we're willing to place all of our trust in him. Our reward must be that we're willing to say, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of us. Our reward must be that we must sing with our life, not just our voices, but with our life. I will trust in the Lord until he comes again. We must reward the Lord with our trust of more of ourself. Today, I pray that you are blessed to know this truth. One, that the Lord will come to your house. Two, that as he comes to your home, he's willing, family, to touch what others won't touch any longer because of the ugliness of the situation. And as he touches family, he's willing to risk his reputation for your and my redemption. And any time the Lord risks everything in heaven and on earth for you, you got to trust him with more. So as he risks rep for your redemption, he then gives you a reward because you're willing to put what matters most in his hands. And if he's willing to do that and he rewards you with healing, the open door, the opportunity, that whatever it is you've been praying for is answered, guess what you need to do? Guess what I have to do? I've got to serve him and I've got to give him more of myself. And I'm encouraging you today to give more of yourself in May to God than you have in April. I'm encouraging you to trust God more this month than last. And watch this, as you trust God more, guess what? God's gonna reward you with more. I can promise you that. I can promise you the reward will be greater. More love, more blessing, more open doors, more sight, more healings, more deliverances, more of your family getting breakthroughs. It's all based on your willingness to trust what matters most in his hands. I pray that you have a great week. I pray that you will let him touch every day something in your life. I pray that you will recognize his risk of his rep for you and your redemption. And I pray that you will receive his reward, the healing, and that you will serve him. I wanna invite you to join me in a special word of prayer. People need prayer. And I want you to join me every Monday and every Friday at 7 a.m. in the morning for a word of prayer. And I promise you, your life will be better. Let me bless you before we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine on you. May God give you peace when others give you trouble. And may the smile of the Lord keep you sane in the crazy world we live in. God loves you and may his peace be yours. Have a good week. Thank you.